Welcome to Invent Anything, where we discuss invention, innovation, and intellectual property. My name is Seth Cronin, and I'm a managing consultant at IP Capital Group. Today, we're going to discuss ChatGPT, an exciting new technology, and more specifically, how ChatGPT can be used for invention and innovation and potentially even intellectual property. ChatGPT is a type of artificial intelligence that can generate human-like text from any prompt. Um, it works similar to a so-called chatbot, where um, it ping-pongs back and forth between you giving it a prompt and it giving you a response. You can ask ChatGPT any question that you can think of in English. It doesn't have to be written very well. And this is a prompt for it to write a response to. ChatGPT is notable for producing human-like text. Um, the things that come out of ChatGPT tend to be lucid, intelligible, and it almost makes it seem like a super smart human being that always has correct punctuation and sentence structure. You can, for example, uh, you can ask ChatGPT how something works, how um, advanced or simplified you want the explanation. And ChatGPT is really good at explaining technology at the level you want to understand it. So you could, for example, ask ChatGPT to explain quantum physics um, at a grade five level. And ChatGPT will give you specific metaphors and choose words based on its understanding of what level you want the explanation. You can prompt it to do anything from write a poem to write um, in a technical structure to write in a more casual or even slang um, terminology. So ChatGPT is a really powerful tool for generating language of all types, not just the formal prose that it sort of defaults to if not given any other prompt. You could, for instance, ask ChatGPT to write the plot for a movie, just giving it any topic to start on. Say you wanted to have it write a romance movie or a disaster movie or a combination of those two, ChatGPT would quickly produce a plot summary of a movie that combined the elements that you included in the prompt. You could even ask ChatGPT to outline a podcast episode, which is precisely what I had it do for this podcast episode. So in a way, um, even though I'm delivering the podcast here and speaking mostly from my experience, ChatGPT actually directed how I should present information about itself to communicate that with you. So I think that would be a really interesting way of showing the power of ChatGPT. So I'll just go ahead and outline the topics ChatGPT thought I should talk about today. First, uh, an explanation of what ChatGPT is and its capabilities. Second, what is AI and how can it be used to invent and innovate? We'll give definitions of artificial intelligence, its applications in different industries. Third, the power of ChatGPT. Explain how ChatGPT differs from other AI technologies and its potential for driving innovation, bringing inventions to the market. We'll talk about some real world, real world use cases, examples of how ChatGPT is being used today in various industries such as healthcare, finance, and customer service, how it's likely to be used in the future. Uh, we'll talk about how to get started with ChatGPT, sort of a step-by-step -step guide for businesses looking to integrate ChatGPT into their operations. And I'll try and give my experience with using ChatGPT for our business, how I structure prompts and iterate on the things I tell ChatGPT to do to get better results. We'll talk about some challenges and limitations associated with ChatGPT. Um, ChatGPT is not a panacea. I don't think it's going to replace um, all knowledge work. In fact, I think what it does is make um, knowledge work much closer to its actual intent, where you can go direct from human knowledge to results with very little friction associated with the mechanical tasks of 
writing up and documenting information. We'll talk about the future of ChatGPT, you know, a look into how ChatGPT will grow, advance, and continue to play a role in driving innovation and even our lives. And then we'll give a summary with some key takeaways, some final thoughts on the potential of ChatGPT in the world of invention, innovation, and intellectual property. So hopefully you can see ChatGPT is a very powerful tool for both creative, research, technical, and even personal projects. Some have even called it a so-called Google killer. Now, Google has been perhaps the most widely used research tool um, in my lifetime. Google is obviously a search engine, and it's a search engine that works in a very interesting way. Google connects you to information by taking the keywords, the prompts that you put in the search engine, and finding those results which are not only most relevant, but also are most hyperlinked from other websites. Basically, it's looking for the hub which many different sources spoke off to, if, if you will. That's how Google does page rankings along with a whole host of other analytics and algorithms that are sort of a black box to most people. One of the problems with something like Google is if you have a really specific question, it's very likely there will not be a highly ranked page that answers that question specifically with a lot of authority. And so Google falls short when you have a lot of layers of limitations on what you're looking for. Um, for instance, I, you know, rock climb. And so if I search for um, rock climbing, I will get very generic results. If I search for workouts for rock climbers, I'll get much more specific results and that content probably exists. If I um, start to add additional features, like I want workouts for training for rock climbing um, with both a mix of weights and body weight exercises and high intensity interval training, and I want this periodized over six months, and I want it to have certain uh, rest weeks based on my schedule, very quickly, you know, Google will sort of collapse and to give me the same results over and over again and kind of hope I figure it out myself from there. ChatGPT is very different. I can keep layering on limitations to Ch ChatGPT and it will continue to tailor its results more and more specific to my prompts. So I could go through that same list of prompts with ChatGPT and it would very likely result in um, an actionable plan based on all those limitations I give it. But there's sort of a big catch. The big catch is there's really no way to tell unless I'm already an expert if the output ChatGPT provided is true and accurate and useful. And this is something we'll talk a lot about today because I think it is the big if, the big question with ChatGPT and it will guide us and inform us of how we can use ChatGPT effectively. Um, others have said that you know, ChatGPT might uh, replace the need for writing education, that you know, writing will no longer be a skill that students really need to, need to study and learn. And I think what ChatGPT has demonstrated is that tools like large language models are very capable at structuring a stream of consciousness, unstructured ideas into a very structured, easy to read format. And it makes more and more the skill of writing look like a commodity technique that a computer can do better than a human. A good example of technology like this is to think about long form mathematics. In an era before the calculators, do, being able to do mathematics in long form, step by step, showing your work, getting an accurate result, that was a skill that needed to be learned and trained. There was tools, perhaps like an abacus, that could make that a little bit easier, but at the end of the day, you couldn't prove your result was accurate unless you showed your work. Once you generate calculators, uh, that electronic devices, that work on a reliable set of electronic and software logic, you no longer need to do long form mathematics. And in fact, it's not only not a skill, it could be um, actually an impediment to your progress in mathematics to be stuck in 
long-form thinking. Instead, you should learn how to use calculators effectively to get the right answer as quickly as possible so that you can do the more interesting mathematic trend transformations that are going to be useful to you. So ChatGPT is that level of step change from you know, learning to do mathematics on paper to having access to a calculator and you, learning how to use a calculator effectively. Um, there are you know, teachers and English professionals out there who think you know, writing may not be a skill that's useful to learn anymore. Um, I'm not the, here to um, necessarily reinforce that opinion or agree with it, but I do think it's an interesting point. So because many provocative statements have been made about ChatGPT, I think in this episode it's really important to focus on what ChatGPT is and how it can be a tool for invention and innovation and intellectual property. We're not going to worry too much about um, the ethics and the social implications that are associated with ChatGPT, although those are very interesting discussions. Instead, I want to look at ChatGPT as the calculator, fresh out of the box, um, and how you can use it to start developing inventions, how to deploy those inventions into the market and create innovation, and how you can actually even generate more, better intellectual property at a much more rapid rate. ChatGPT, I think, will speed up cre creativity. In my mind, that's one of its most important uses, that you can get lucid, accurate writing at the speed of thought. And that's a phrase I think um, is really meaningful with ChatGPT, because the faster you can write your prompt, get your thought out in a structure that ChatGPT can understand, the better results you'll get at a quicker pace. There's a whole philosophical discussion of what ChatGPT means for inventors and creatives in the future. Um, and there's a whole discussions around how best to use this tool effectively and ethically. We're going to explore some of those areas, but there's too many <laughs> areas to go down when it comes to ChatGPT for just this one episode of the podcast. So we're going to give a really high level view today. And in the future, we may drill down into some specific topics. So topic one is, you know, what is ChatGPT? What are its capabilities? As we mentioned, ChatGPT is really a chatbot. It's a computer program designed to simulate conversation between human users, especially over the internet. It's said that chatbots treat conversations like a game of tennis. I talk, the chatbot replies. I talk again, the chatbot replies. An advanced chatbot like ChatGPT is context aware. That means it understands every single um, line in the communication. And so anytime I put in um, a new piece of information, it considers all the previous pieces of information that I've put into the thread. This is very different than, say, um, one of the first chatbots I ever interacted with was um, a chatbot in AOL Instant Messenger. And it was called Smarter Child. So Smarter Child was a very, today, primitive chatbot. It didn't really remember anything about you. Um, it would answer questions in human-like prompt, but it was very easy to get Smarter Child to just say, I don't know, I, I don't have any meaningful response to that. Um, if you asked it complicated questions, it wouldn't be able to answer, but it could do some interesting things, like you could ask it for the weather today, or you could ask it for um, a local listing of movies that were playing at in theaters. Smarter Child had a couple interesting functions that made it a conversational AI. Of course, this is decades old now, um, and I think it's just interesting to point out how far chatbot technology has come. What does ChatGPT mean? GPT stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. Let's break that down so we understand all the parts. Generative, of course, means that it generates text. It's a generative AI. AI can be many different things. For instance, an AI can be analytical, which is an AI takes data and um, analyzes it, it to do something. Um, you can give it an input and it gives it an output based on what it's analyzed. There's a type of artificial intelligence called machine learning, which you give it a large data set and it learns things about that data that it can 
then use to analyze and interpret future scenarios. A generative AI is specifically trained to create some sort of generation. Now, there could be visual generation. It could be sound generation. In ChatGPT's case, it is text. It generates text and pretty much only text, um, which is not to say just letters and language. Um, pretty much anything you can generate on a computer keyboard, all the ASCII characters, um, ChatGPT can produce really well. And this is important to point out because um, one of the big applications now in my conversations with friends is using ChatGPT as a computer coding assistant, which is to say you can ask for a specific function in a specific coding language um, in a specific coding environment to get a sample of computer code that you can use in your um, entire, you know, coding stack. Whether or not that code works is something the <laughs> web, the developer has to determine for themselves. But just one really interesting example of this is um, GPT-4, the latest public release of the chat GPT technology, was capable of taking a paper drawing, a hand drawing of a website, what the user wanted the website to look like at the end of the day, and produce HTML code. HTML is the hypertext markup language that is used for almost all website pages that you see on the internet. And this HTML code was perfectly viable to put um, onto an HTML reader, like a, a web browser, and produced a working website based on this drawing. The P in GPT stands for pre-trained. Um, so what that means is you do not need to teach ChatGPT about the English language. You don't need to give it documents um, so it understands the type of language you're looking for. It's already initially trained on a large data set of language. It allows it to learn the patterns of language and to reproduce those with um, generations. And the T stands for transformer. This is the part of the name that actually refers to the architecture using the model. It's designed to effectively process sequences of data, like words in a sentence, um, but also potentially things like computer code. So not only can you ask ChatGPT to produce computer code, I've also heard of a use case where you can take a piece of computer code, put it into the chatbot of ChatGPT, and say, I'm getting this error code. Can you help me debug this code? And um, in one ex example, an anecdote, a friend of mine was able to debug 400 lines of code where he wasn't certain where the error was being generated from. And ChatGPT was perfectly capable of um, identifying that area and helping him debug the code very quickly. So the result of all this is a highly advanced language model that can generate human-like text based on the input it receives, making it a powerful tool for automating various processes and improving customer experiences. For example, if you have ChatGPT deployed in a customer um, experience, customer service environment. One of the things I think it's really important to understand with ChatGPT is that ChatGPT doesn't know anything. It's not an expert in any field. It has no authority on any subject. The only way you know if ChatGPT is giving you a correct answer is if you already know the correct answer. One example of this is um, just last night, I was discussing some of the benefits of ChatGPT with my wife and she um, said, okay, well, let, let's test it out. There's a piece of semiconductor equipment that I found out one of my employees didn't really understand how it worked. So I had to type up an explanation of how it works so, so they understood. And I said, okay, yeah, let, I, that sounds like a perfect task to deploy ChatGPT could have saved you a lot of time. So we typed in the, the name of the component for semiconductor manufacturing, and ChatGPT gave back 
an answer, which I read off confidently, thinking that it was perfectly accurate because I'm not a semiconductor engineer. I don't know the correct answer of how this particular component worked. By my read, it sounded like it worked really well. But my wife, who works on this technology every day, could instantly point out parts where ChatGPT had gotten it wrong. She said, no, that the component doesn't work this way. It actually works this way. And I would say, oh, per perfect. Well, then you correct ChatGPT and it gives another response. And I read that second response back and she says, well, you know, that's closer, but it's still not quite right. And so you see, you really actually, when you want the truth on a subject, when you want ChatGPT to produce results that reflect true, accurate information, you need a priori information about what is true and correct in the thing you're asking about. One of the scary things with ChatGPT is it will always sound confident. It will always look real. If it was typed by a human, you would be pretty confident that human knew what they were talking about. But ChatGPT isn't a human. It doesn't know what it's talking about. It knows what the correct response would look like. And it's very good at producing that result. So ChatGPT is trained on a large data set. It does give accurate information about many topics. You can think about it as a, um, a super human being that had memorized every page of Wikipedia. And I think Wikipedia is a particularly good example because as you know, any high school teacher will remind their students, Wikipedia is not actually the authority on any subject. Anyone can go into Wikipedia and edit it and put information there that looks true. But unless it can be verified to an expert source, it's very difficult to tell if those things in Wikipedia are actually true. ChatGPT has the same problem, right? It looks like it has the real answer, but unless you actually know the real answer or know the source that can provide the real answer, it's very difficult to determine if what it has produced is actually true and accurate. So humans know things, right? We have a variety of sources. We have experiences. We have people we talk to. The story I'm telling about my wife comes from experience that I had recently, and so I can feel pretty confident that there's some truth behind what I'm saying. ChatGPT could produce um, a narrative about a conversation I had with my wife last night, and it would guess maybe some points would seem true, but only I, me and my wife, would know whether or not any of those discussions actually happened, right? And people talk to each other, they know things that other people say, um, they've been certain places, they've seen certain things, they've read books, they've even thought about things logically. ChatGPT doesn't do any of those things. ChatGPT generates text that looks like it would be a good answer to a prompt. It's not a person, it doesn't think, it doesn't really know the correct answer about anything. It knows what the correct answer should look like, or it thinks it knows what the correct answer should look like. And to really explain this, there's a great philosophical thought experiment called the Chinese room. And I think this explains perfectly what ChatGPT is doing. So the Chinese room thought experiment is to imagine a person in a room, he can't leave the room, he can't get any information on the outside except once a day or once an hour or once a minute or once a second, a piece of paper is passed through a slot in the door that can only fit a piece of paper and no light can go through. Again, don't worry too much about the uh, physics of this. It is simply a thought experiment. The paper that is passed through is a page of text, which is in Chinese. Now the person in the room, let's call him John, doesn't speak Chinese. So John can't read what's on the paper. But in the room with John is tome after tome, book after book, or you could even just say a computer that is not connected to the internet. It doesn't include any translations of Chinese. It doesn't contain any information about how to speak or learn to read Chinese. But what it does is it contains instructions for how to take the piece of paper 
that contains these Chinese characters and turn it into another piece of paper that contains different Chinese characters. And then the person in the room, John, is then meant to take the second piece of paper that he's just written with the Chinese characters he doesn't understand, but has, you know, these, this collection of books or a computer that tells him the instructions of what to write in Chinese on the second piece of paper, and then he slips it back out the door. So the thing to understand is that it doesn't matter what is happening on the other side of the door, right? John doesn't know if he's um, writing a technical manual, if he's passing love letters, if he's giving instructions for war. John doesn't speak Chinese. The, on the other side of the door, there could be life or death decisions being made based on the pieces of paper John produces. There could be um, a, um, a whole number of people who are um, you know, swooning over the lucid prose and what a genius uh, lives on the other side of the door. They could be absolutely infuriated about the offensive opinions on the person on the other side of the door. The um, Chinese text that John is producing could have any effect on the outside world. It could seem perfectly accurate. Heck, it could even be, you know, a dissertation on the Chinese language. But John doesn't know any of that because John doesn't speak Chinese. All he has is the technology to transfer, to take the prompt in, which he doesn't understand, and put a prompt out, which he also doesn't understand. So it doesn't matter how real how human the things that John is writing seem. John doesn't know what's going on on the other side of the door. That is ChatGPT. And I think that is one of the reasons why ChatGPT is so powerful and so scary at the same time. You know, there's sort of this joke that, you know, in the next year, ChatGPT will replace all, you know, writers. And a year after that, it will, um, you know, replace all managers and CEOs and it'll be running its own business and the year after that it'll be taking over whole countries and controlling um, world politics as we know it. ChatGPT feels like this Chinese room that given the right prompt could do anything but it won't know. It won't have any valence. It won't have opinions about what it's doing. It'll just take the paper in, follow the instructions and toss the paper out not knowing what either paper means. Another thought experiment or test to think about with ChatGPT is something like the Turing test. The Turing test is a test, um, I think originally credited to Alan Turing, one of the forefathers of computing. And the Turing test is to create a computer simulation which can fool a human into thinking that the computer is a human. Um, ChatGPT is a chat bot where you can ask it things and it says things back and it almost feels like you're talking to a person. ChatGPT in its current form would likely fail a so-called Turing test because it's too smart. It knows too much about too many subjects. And it's very rare for it to say, I don't know. It typically will say this canned response, which I'm just a large language model, so I don't actually know anything about how to treat your heart condition. However, there are some things I do know about this, and you know, it'll give you um, some steps you can take to improve your heart health, for example, um, before asking you, you know, reminding you that you should really talk to a doctor. Um, ChatGPT also does a lot of things that humans typically don't. It repeats phrases. It never asks questions back, um, really, uh, unless you engage it in a certain way where you've kind of prodded it to ask you the next question to continue the conversation. For the most part, um, it's, a ping, it's a tennis game. You'll send a prompt over, ChatGPT will send something back, and it will never say anything again until you serve the tennis ball back, uh, metaphorically speaking. ChatGPT was not really designed as a... Turing test contestant, though. ChatGPT was designed to generate text that looks human-like, so humans could use that text for whatever purpose they wanted it to. So what ChatGPT is really good at doing is taking your ideas and turning them 
based on the prompt you give it into um, suppose, you know, quote unquote, well-written text that you could use for some other purpose. And we'll talk about what those purposes are. So we'll move on now to topic two. What is AI? How can it be used to invent and innovate? And we'll talk about some definitions of AI and its applications in different industries. So we know that artificial intelligence is the simulation of human intelligence in machines that are designed to think and act like humans. These systems are really algorithms. They're Chinese rooms, right? They take an input and they create an output. They're statistical models to analyze and make decisions in real time with the goal of replicating or augmenting human intelligence. And I would like to underline augmenting human intelligence because it's um, very clear at this stage in artificial intelligence that human intelligence drives most of the productive results. Um, AI, uh, when it's unsupervised, when it doesn't have an intelligent human guiding its activities, it can quickly quote unquote go off the rails and produce results that make sense to it algorithmically, but look like total gibberish or you know, garbage from a human's perspective. AI technologies include a range of different technologies inside of each of these buckets. There's thousands and thousands of different products and approaches, but just to give a few examples, there's machine learning, which we talked about a little bit earlier, taking a large data set of anything, whether that's images or text, and having the machine learn what those the significance of those data items are. There's a couple of approaches like um, supervised and unsupervised machine learning, kind of out of the scope of today's discussion. There's natural language processing, or NLP, which is to take natural language, whether in text or voice, doing some voice to text conversion, and converting that into action. So if anyone's ever used something like a smart speaker, you talk to um, Google Home, Amazon Alexa, or Siri, when you ask the digital assistant to do something, it is doing NLP. It is trying to extract an action in software out of the words that you have provided to it. There's things like computer vision, which take an image or camera feed and try to identify objects in the field or some other transformation of that image. So. Um, computer vision is very important in the world of autonomous vehicles. It's taking a real-time image, whether that's visual light or LIDAR or radar or some other um, image modality, and trying to figure out how can I safely drive through this space. And there's also expert systems, which don't get a lot of um, talk about, but I think will make a lot of sense as soon as I explain them. Expert systems are essentially the opposite in a way of something like ChatGPT, where expert systems aren't necessarily interested in giving the prompt that looks right, but the prompt that is right. So an expert system is um, a structure that experts can actually sort of download their expert opinions on things into a logical framework so that when someone wants to know the expert level answer to a specific question, they can consult the expert system, and the only thing that the expert system will say back is something that an expert has deemed appropriate to respond in that scenario. The problem with something like expert systems is they will fall short in any area where the expert hasn't explicitly given the um, expert system knowledge of it. There is likely to be in the coming years advanced expert systems which can take a combination of expert opinions and extrapolate out of that expert opinion um, the answer to some new scenario. However, I think it's pretty clear that as soon as you're extrapolating in software the expert's opinion into a scenario that the expert hasn't explicitly approved of, you have a scenario where you are very likely to give something that looks like an expert opinion, like ChatGPT, but is actually wrong. And an expert might be quick to spot that, but a layman or someone who just is not as experienced as the expert might miss the inaccuracy and believe that it's an expert opinion and potentially do something 
dangerous or wrong or unethical based on the impression that the expert system has the correct expert opinion, but not knowing that it actually doesn't. There's other types of AI that we don't really have time to cover today. Um, there's, uh, you know, inference engines, there's uh, knowledge bases, there's uh, a lot of these Expert systems are used in things like healthcare, finance, and manufacturing. Healthcare, getting some diagnostic um, analysis. You can imagine ChatGPT being trained on something like WebMD. And so it's a very narrow field of focus. You give it um, some symptoms and it can suggest a diagnosis. Once again, it doesn't know anything about real human biology, but it can have rules such that a confluence of symptomology can be directly related with a subset of diagnoses. Um, similarly in finance, things like indexing, account re rebalancing, risk exposure, um, these are very mechanical applications of artificial intelligence where they're doing mathematical transformations of various financial data, but those are essentially expert systems. When you say to your 401k provider, I want um, an aggressive risk exposure, so I'll have 90% of my portfolio in stocks, equities, and similar risk exposure devices, um, real, real estate investment trusts, and I'll have 10% in guaranteed income like bonds. Similarly, in manufacturing, you can get an error code from a machine, and an expert system might tell you exactly what steps to take to rectify that error code, what part of the machine or the manufacturing environment needs to be repaired or modified somehow. Other examples of expert systems. The goal of AI is really to create systems that can perform tasks that typically require human intelligence and do those faster and more reliably. Things like recognizing speech, understanding natural language, making decisions, solving pro problems. The background of artificial intelligence really sort of um, cuts it into two buckets, business process automation and robotic process automation. Business process automation being something even as simple you could think of as a email autoresponder. Instead of a human being having to sit there and let uh, um, people know that they're on vacation or just not respond to an email at all, you can automate that process by setting up an autoresponder and your business process is now automated to let incoming email know immediately that you're out of office and won't be responding to email during a certain time. This can scale up into every level of business from management to key performance indicators to customer service to supply chain management. Every level of business in the year 2023 has some level of business process automation. Robotic process automation is more what we think of in a manufacturing environment where something is happening out in the real world that is, seems to be human intelligence. One of the great examples of this is modern car manufacturing. Car manufacturing used to take a lot of human intelligence to figure out how to take the components and assemble them correctly, make sure all the lug nuts were at the proper torque, make sure that the engine uh, was all connected properly. This can now be automated by actual robots that assemble the vehicle. So that's an example of robotic process information. Artificial intelligence has a long history going back to at least the 1950s. This is when the first AI programs were created and these were just basically rule-based systems, really simple examples uh, like I talked about before, that you have a certain input and you've trained a set of rules to deal with input in that way. Very early basic AI. In the 1980s, you saw the emergence of the first expert systems. You basically use a real knowledge base of AI to solve complex problems. Um, this becomes more and more important in fields like statistics and data processing, where doing manual manipulation of data becomes extremely difficult. You use expert systems to 
transform that data into a useful way that humans can do something with, they can interpret it. By the 1990s, we saw the first introduction of machine learning. This is where an AI is not specifically directly programmed to follow certain rules, but it learns what the rules are on its own. So it has sort of a meta rule where it knows to go and look for the patterns and in certain information and create rules that no human could necessarily come up with on their own that can achieve a certain goal that the AI is trying to achieve. By the 2010s, uh, we saw advancements in deep learning and the first rise of large scale language models, such as GPT-3. Today, AI is being used across industries to drive innovation, automate tasks, and improve customer experiences. We've gotten, in the last couple of days even, inbound marketing emails saying that they want to help us automate our content marketing using chat GPT. So use of chat GPT is now a service that people will offer to generate blog articles, social media posts, white papers, and any other kind of text information that would typically be written up by a human. Companies are now claiming that they can produce all of this in basically minutes instead of days and for a much lower cost than would previously be expected of that kind of service. In the future, I think we'll see continued advancements in AI technology, certainly, but increasingly using AI to solve com complex social and business problems and drive breakthroughs into various fields. Instead of now use, you know, loading business data and looking for statistical trends, you'll have this whole complex of business problems that you'll put into an interface like ChatGPT, and it'll essentially become an expert consultant where it'll be looking for clues in the things that you're telling it to almost divine what is the most meaningful action it can give you to drive business results. I also think this is going to happen in people's personal lives where people will be trying to solve complex personal problems. They would typically have to go to a number of people, friends and family members and therapists and life coaches to solve, suddenly they'll have access to these free tools that can provide a lot of that information really quickly. We'll move on now to topic three, which is the power of ChatGPT. How ChatGPT differs from other AI technologies and its potential for driving innovation. ChatGPT is different than other AI technologies. And I think one of the best ways to think about these rule-based systems, expert systems, is comparing it to another generative system. So one of the ones that I think is really interesting is the Autodesk Generative Design. Um, there's a TED Talk by Michael Conti. We uh, will put in the, the show notes. But this is um, a TED Talk titled The Incredible Inventions of Intuitive AI. And what Michael Conti showed in this TED Talk was you could create designs for things like vehicles, physical objects, based on a set of AI rules and having the AI iterate the design to optimize for certain features like low weight or wind resistance or... Um, different design features that you want, and it would come up with complex, almost organic designs that would be just about impossible for a human to create creator to come up with. It can op optimize for certain structural features of an object in a way that sort of confounds the typical engineering approach of drawing sort of uh, smooth, square, linear, curvilinear lines and arranging them in such a way to get a result. You see these kind of almost organic cellular honeycomb-like patterns in the generative AI designs. And um, BAN is a system which is optimize, optimizing for certain results regardless of how human-like the eventual result looks like. So that's sort of an expert system that is going to get you results 
that very clearly no human could have produced. ChatGPT is actually kind of the opposite. Um, ChatGPT wants to convince you that what it produced looks like a human wrote it, even if it doesn't necessarily get you the results you wanted. So for instance, um, we could go back to the example of asking ChatGPT you know, how to deal with a heart condition. Since it's not an expert system, it actually doesn't know anything. It could recommend, say, you to take a statin, whereas um, that might be the exact wrong thing to do because of your own biochemistry, your own um, family medical history. But ChatGPT wouldn't know anything about that. And even if you told ChatGPT about those features of your physiology, ChatGPT might not know what to do with that information. It would give you an answer that seemed very confident and might intuitively seem correct, even though it isn't really. Whereas an expert system might do the opposite. It gives you results that seem counterintuitive, that you don't believe at first, but are actually accurate. Um, it might be a certain lifestyle change, and diet change, or um, something exotic like spending time in a hyperbaric chamber. Um, this is not medical advice anyway. I'm just trying to give examples of how expert systems can differ because they aren't constrained by trying to look like the correct answer, right? to, to disguise the AI-ness of them. And so the output of an expert system could be exotic or robotic or you know, not really seem conversational, but be accurate, whereas ChatGPT can seem really accurate it can seem conversational, it can seem like a human wrote it, but be totally inaccurate and give you the wrong information. So the important thing about ChatGPT compared to some other expert systems is that any literate person can use it. And I think this is why it's so powerful. No training is required, unlike the Autodesk generative design by, by Michael Conti. You don't need to know how to use any special piece of software. If you can type on a computer and produce words, language, even if they're not spelled correctly, ChatGPT could work for you. And there's no specific domain knowledge needed to get started, either about AI or even the industry you're working with, um, where you might want to invent. It can be very useful to know things about that industry. But one of the things I love about ChatGPT is it makes it so easy to just get started. Um, in fields of invention and lots of creative fields, there's this well-known phenomenon called analysis paralysis, where people who want to be creative, people who want to be inventive, spend so much time analyzing, trying to understand the best way to start that they never get started in the first place. They'll read articles and they'll watch YouTube videos and they'll try and fill their mind with information but never actually get started on their idea, their creative insight. And they spend so much of their time and energy on the analysis that when it comes to acting, they actually become paralyzed. They feel like there's too much information out there for them to fully incorporate into their workflow. And I think ChatGPT can short circuit that whole process by giving you the first rough draft of anything really quickly. And so what I mean is you could ask ChatGPT, what are the major problems in green energy? And it'll give you a list of those um, items. And so you can pick a list of those items and say, well, I do want to solve some problem in green energy. That looks like a promising problem. I think I know enough about that to get started. And you could ask ChatGPT for a deeper explanation or for some technologies in the green energy field that might help solve that problem. And ChatGPT will give you more and more information about those technologies. And once you have any kind of creative spark, you can ask ChatGPT for a description of a solution for this green energy problem using this specific piece of technology that you've learned about and deployed in this certain way, um, you know, say to create energy credits that are, you know, can be 
bought and sold as NFTs that are related to your solar panels and the value of them is directed towards not only how much energy you generate, but how little energy you consume over time. And so you create this incentive program. Um, while I explain this, it just sounds like gobbledygook, but if I took those technological elements and put them into ChatGPT, it would produce an invention abstract that seemed very coherent and that you would probably be comfortable sending to an investor or putting in a business plan or adding to a presentation slide. So it can take these very disparate unstructured ideas and structure them really quickly. ChatGPT itself can be deployed as an innovation in many particularly industries. So I just talked about an example of how you can use ChatGPT as an invention tool but ChatGPT is itself an invention, and that invention can be deployed as an innovation in many, many different industries. Customer service is an obvious one. So you can have ChatGPT trained um, on the, let's just say, the manual of a specific, specific technology that you sell. Let's say it's a power tool. So instead of someone having to read the manual, which you should always do if you're using a power tool, but most people don't, they could ask ChatGPT trained on the manual questions about the power tool, ChatGPT could give you the answer. And in that way, it becomes just like an expert system, except it doesn't really know a priori what questions people ask. It can simply interpolate based on what they're saying. So if it said, can I use this power drill to drill a hole in my wall near the bathtub? it would probably say, well, your drill is capable of drilling through the wall, but there's a huge risk of going through a pipe when you are working near um, water sources like a bathtub. So before you drill anything, you have to verify that you're not about to drill through a pipe because not only will that create a lot of water damage, it will also risk electrocution because you're using a power tool and on and on and on manual for a drill can't cover all those scenarios, but it can know that bathtubs are associated with water. There's information in the manual that the device should never be used around water, and ChatGPT could easily connect those two concepts and answer a question that um, is related to the manual and um, doesn't necessarily need to be uh, pre-trained on all the scenarios to give a reasonable answer that would be useful to the, the customer. Another great example of how ChatGPT is being deployed is in coding. Software coding has a lot of difficult problems to solve. Essentially, no developer on the face of the earth knows every command available in every language on every coding environment. A lot of coding environments have legacy code that is more esoteric and not as clean and accessible as new code. Uh, any software stack might have been developed over years and years by many different programmers <laughs> with different levels of experience. And this creates a lot of problems when you're a software developer and trying to add a new feature. You know, you're worried, is this going to break old features? Is this going to cause any other problems that I don't foresee? Oh, and by the way, I don't even know the specific lines of code that create the function that you want. Traditionally, software developers would have to do a lot of research to determine what is this function, what kind of code is used to deploy it, how can I integrate that in my entire software stack, is this going to break anything else, code debug, code debug. ChatGPT can accelerate that whole process. Instead of asking Google and doing a deep dive on a software development forum, ChatGPT can just give you sample code that is customized to your requirements. And if you put that code into your developer server, right, you wouldn't want it to go straight to production, and you test it, and you get an error code, you could actually feed that error code back into ChatGPT. And so it'll get the result from its software function. If it's wrong, you can actually update the software code now based on that function and try to get it right. Because again, ChatGPT has been trained on all this data from these software development forums. So it knows how to iterate on code when 
problems arise. And it's just so much faster to use ChatGPT than to, as a human, read all this stuff and figure out how to deploy it in your specific environment. Full disclosure, I'm not a software developer, but I have talked with friends who do software development for a living, and this is exactly how they're using ChatGPT. Pretty soon, um, ChatGPT is being deployed as a so-called co-pilot in coding environments. So ChatGPT will not just be a website that you can go to type in your problems and get answers out. ChatGPT will be a module on your software development platform so that at any time you can highlight a piece of text and right click on it, click on the co-pilot button, get all sorts of information about the code that you highlighted, uh, what it does, what it connects to, what problems you might look for, how to improve it, how to connect to it, on and on and on. ChatGPT has obvious applications in the writing industry. I already talked about a business that offer to generate ad copy, blogs and articles, and educational materials using ChatGPT. Essentially, anyone who is writing today is likely to be using ChatGPT in some way if they want to be competitive and effective. I don't think the great American novel is going anywhere. I think those people who write for artistic purposes will still likely work in a manual sort of long form way, but they could use ChatGPT to get a lot of information about their writing topic really quickly, even if ChatGPT isn't penning all the lines of their information. I think all great books have some level of research that goes into creating them. And being able to speed up that research with ChatGPT and get ideas for, say, the way certain instruments are played or the certain kinds of people in a culture or um, different types of martial arts or religious ideas or motivational self-help topics, all of those will be much quicker to access through ChatGPT. And I think most writers who want to be highly productive will only be able to keep up with the level of productivity of other writers using ChatGPT by using ChatGPT themselves. And this extends to basically all creative work. ChatGPT is really good at producing many ideas really quickly. So I think you can get to the low hanging fruit answers of any topic much quicker using ChatGPT. You can also prompt ChatGPT to give you less common um, results, um, unexpected results. So you can prompt ChatGPT to give you not the results that you would expect, but more and more uncommon results or outlandish results. One example of this is in the early first few times I was using ChatGPT, I've had a idea for writing a musical that has just been an idea floating in the back of my head. I've never so much as written down any piece of it in my, my journal or you know where I write music and ideas down. But I asked ChatGPT to just give me a plot based on some basic elements of the musical that I had in mind. Stream of consciousness, I just entered this into ChatGPT, and it produced a, a whole plot, not that it was very good, but it was totally sensible of what it produced. And just at, to, to continue with this example, there was a part of the plot that had to do with characters trying to come up with technological solutions to a problem. And at first I asked ChatGPT to give me some technologies that they might be suggesting. And I was quick to think like, well, this musical is set in the future and the answers it's giving me are a little too obvious. They're a little too, you know, today, right? They're technologies that could be deployed off the shelf in our current world. And so I asked ChatGPT to produce more expected and outlandish technology, and suddenly it gave me results of things that I had never heard of and probably don't exist at all, like you know, harnessing gravity to generate energy or um, you know, 
using uh, dark energy from a black hole in order to create energy, things like that. Uh, ChatGPT is capable once prodded to give you seemingly more creative, less common, unexpected ideas. And that can be really interesting results. One of the hard things with invention and creative work is getting unique ideas. And ChatGPT can give you those sparks of new unique ideas much faster than tra traditional means. Could take a lot of research into science, science fiction topics to get to some of those ideas. I could just ask ChatGPT the question and get to the answer really quickly. There's a bit of a philosophical theme here that I think is important for invention and creativity is that bad ideas can help create good ideas which is to say many people are very good at critiquing a bad idea, but very few people can um, generate good ideas fluently. One of the things you can do is provide critiques to chat GPT, and it will iterate on the answer to give you better and better results. So you can use chat GPT like a human collaborator you can give it your idea, ask ChatGPT to critique the idea. You can get a counter idea from ChatGPT based on its critique. You can then go and critique ChatGPT's idea and ask it to reproduce the result based on your critique and go around and go around and go around. The more creative your prompt and the more interesting your critiques, the better and better results you can get from this. One of the ways I like to think of ChatGPT is like a free, fast intern, like a hyper-caffeinated intern who is sort of like excited to work really fast and generate results, but not necessarily that good at determining which results are great and which ones are kind of not very good. But one of the great things about an intern is that you can give them direct feedback and they can improve over time. A thread with ChatGPT is just like that. You can coach it on which ideas you don't think are useful to you and which ideas you think are useful to you and make it more and more likely that ChatGPT will give you results that are useful. One of the principles with any technology like this is, quote, garbage in, garbage out. If you give a bad prompt, you're going to give a bad result. And prompt structure is becoming so important a skill that we've seen in the last couple of days, people posting job um, requests for a so-called prompt engineer, someone who can sit in a meeting, understand the problems that the company is facing, and engineer a prompt for ChatGPT that can solve that problem, whether it's something like generating content for a blog or um, other employments, or it could be any business problem that they want to have a public position on, a document circulating. ChatGPT can help you get there quickly, but you need to be able to engineer the right prompt in order to get those results. ChatGPT really has the potential to revolutionize the way we interact with technology. It can solve complex problems in a wide range of fields, from customer service to product design. And I think we'll see ChatGPT being sort of this fly on the window in anything we do in the digital sphere. Eventually, we really want to get ChatGPT out into the real world. And I can imagine a future where you have a ChatGPT-like service in your earpiece at all times, where ChatGPT, you could be out for a walk, have an idea, ask your earpiece, which is trained with ChatGPT, a question, and get ideas directly in essentially your head, you know, through, through the speaker in your earpiece. And the way you navigate the world with technology like that will fundamentally change. ChatGPT's ability to generate human-like text based on input makes it a highly versatile technology with essentially endless applications in almost any industry. The next topic we'll talk about is specific use cases. These are some real-world examples of how ChatGPT can be used in various industries, various technological verticals, um, with three specific examples, 
healthcare, finance, and customer service. So ChatGPT is being used to automate administrative tasks in healthcare and improve patient outcomes. This is, I think, one of the huge important developments in ChatGPT because in countries like the United States, healthcare is extremely expensive. And that's for a lot of complex reasons, which are way beyond the scope of this podcast. But one of those reasons is due to the need for a large number of healthcare administrators. These are people with no medical education. They do important work, and I don't want to say anything negative about these careers because they have a vital role in our healthcare system. However, the number of careers in the healthcare industry has grown outpacing the number of physicians and medically trained staff. And this includes nurses and students and people at all levels of performing medical tasks. Administrators outnumber medical teams now in most healthcare ecosystems like 10 to one. So for every one doctor, there's like 10 administrators who administrate the paperwork essentially of the healthcare system. And these tasks are varied. They have to deal with insurance and patient information and scheduling and um, malpractice and communications and marketing and many, many, many administrative tasks. I am not a medical administrator, healthcare administrator. I do not have like a complete appreciation for what uh, healthcare administration really involves from the perspective of someone inside the industry. But many of these tasks are repetitive and um, may not require as much human intelligence as the cost that is currently created to to justify these. So um, just for one example, scheduling time with a doctor or healthcare position might be something that is much better done through an interface like ChatGPT than through a human you know, operator, a uh, call service. If ChatGPT can understand the doctor that you want to have a meeting with, what your schedule looks like and what your doctor's schedule looks like, it could faster and more effectively find the correct time to schedule a medical appointment than perhaps uh, a human would be able to do. Now, it's great to always have a human sort of in the loop so that if the AI fails, you can always get to a human when you need. But you free up so much time for these humans by getting the repetitive non-value add tasks taken care of by something like ChatGPT. So they can do the job that is really difficult more effectively. And those are the really complex problems where you have a patient who doesn't understand um, English or finances very well, and they don't like this doctor, but they do want to see this doctor, and they can't get access to transportation during certain times of the day, ChatGPT isn't going to be able to solve all those problems. A human administrator would. But currently, human administrators are so overloaded with repetitive tasks that it's also very difficult for them to deal with those exotic problems that are very specific and situational. So one of the things that ChatGPT is really promising for is actually freeing up time to do more value-add work by getting rid of all the repetitive tasks where you kind of turn off your brain and go through the motions. ChatGPT should be able to go through those motions much quicker and potentially automate a lot of these administrative tasks and actually reduce the number of errors, make it faster to process insurance claims, streamline a lot of processes, and ultimately improve patient outcomes what effect this will have on the total employment for hospital and healthcare administrators is unknown. Um, It might not have no effect. It just simply might make these administrators more effective at their jobs. It may free them up to pursue other careers where their skills are still more needed and valuable. 
and where concierge human interactions are more valuable than in these repetitive administrative tasks. And so ultimately, when technology can replace careers, these can become really contentious discussions. But as uh, someone who really embraces new technology and who has studied economics, I believe a lot of these concerns are actually temporary structural unemployment problems. I completely acknowledge and agree and believe that administrators have an important set of skills that are valuable to a wide range of industries. Um, but I think those administrators would agree as well that there's a lot of repetitive tasks that if they had the right technology to solve those repetitive tasks for them, they would free up a lot of their time and energy to work on those more value add tasks, whether or not it's in the healthcare industry or in other industries where that, that skill set is really valuable. Similarly in finance, um, chat GPT can be used to improve financial services and customer experiences in um, a lot of populations, places in the world, groups of people, financial literacy is very low. Financial topics seem really difficult to understand. They seem not interesting to a lot of people. In my life, at least, uh, that I talk to, I am personally interested in personal finance and um, you know, not really like government finance, but I know a lot of people are interested in those topics as well. But ChatGPT can totally revolutionize the way financial institutions interact with customers. Customers have a lot of questions about finance that they're afraid to ask because they don't want to look stupid or they um, don't even know the right questions to ask about their finances and services like ChatGPT can give a highly personalized, interactive, and improve overall customer experience by letting customers interact freely, gain just the right amount of information, and um, at the right level of understanding for them. So if a, um, someone who is really financially illiterate is talking to a financial advisor, it's a really common experience. The financial advisor will provide jargon that is they're familiar with, um, in the industry. I, you know, I mentioned some of these things before, um, mutual funds, a 401k, um, bonds, equities. These are concepts I'm familiar with, but there are millions, if not billions of people on planet Earth that are not familiar with these concepts. And those are words for which they have no direct concept, even, even things like financial risk and exposure to certain types of markets and what a risk balance means and what a risk preference means. These concepts are really esoteric if you've never approached them before. And one of the things ChatGPT is really good at is, uh, for lack of a better word, dumbing things down to the level at you, which you're capable of un understanding it. So if you said, hey, ChatGPT, explain equities to me like a grade five level, ChatGPT might be able to say an equity is a partial ownership of any kind of company or business entity. And equity is usually pegged to the value of the overall company. So as the company grows and becomes more valuable, the equity you have in your company is more valuable. You can think about this like the equity in your house where the more um, of your mortgage that you have paid off or the more valuable your house becomes over time, the more, quote, equity you have in your house. So when you go to sell your house, you can get more money for your house, just the way if you're, the companies you have equity in grows, you can sell that equity and you'll get more money for the equity than you would have gotten if the company didn't grow. Uh, maybe that's not a grade five level explanation of an equity, but ChatGPT could give an even better answer than that. And again, if you're talking to a human who's your financial advisor, you might not want to let on to your financial advisor that you're not very financially savvy. However, uh, talking to a, an AI system like ChatGPT, you don't really have any concerns about how you're appearing to someone else. And I think just to extrapolate up, customer service in general is going to be transformed by ChatGPT. Asking for in information about products, trying to figure out which product is right for the problem you're trying to solve in your life. Um, I can totally imagine 
in the next few days, weeks, months, services like Amazon.com will start to look more and more like ChatGPT. And because there are so many products for sale in e-commerce, it's actually really difficult to determine what product you want to buy. If you think about this, search for any product. Just looking at my desk, I have you know, a laptop and a microphone, and there's a pop filter attached to a microphone. These products I selected based on, I was familiar with the brand of microphone that I purchased. The laptop is my company, IP Capital Group's property, so they chose it for me. But if I didn't know anything about microphones, selecting this product would have been extremely difficult. There are hundreds of different brands that look just like this. Um, and in fact, this might not be the best product for me to have chose to record this podcast on. Um, it just happened to be one product I was familiar with when I was shopping for microphones for podcasting. And so I didn't want to do the work to figure out what the product that would be best suited to my purposes would be. So I went with the brand I was familiar with to have some level of confidence that I was getting a legitimate product that was at least reasonably suited to the task I was deploying without much concern for getting the best price or something like that. With a customer service interface like ChatGPT, not only could it help me locate the best product for my budget for the specific purpose I'm deploying it for, but once it knew I had bought that product, it could give me all sorts of tips and tricks for how I could use it to improve my experience, other software that it worked well with, um, different ways to place it on the desk, different products like this pop filter. Like to even know you would need or want a pop filter for your microphone requires some understanding of digital audio and audio recording. I happen to have a background in audio recording, so it seemed natural to me to purchase this pop filter for my microphone because I didn't want the popping sound you get from plosives, you know, words that start with like a, a P, create a puff of air that create a popping sound in the microphone. If you don't have a background in audio recording, you don't know anything about that, but ChatGPT could guide you on that journey really quickly. If you simply asked ChatGPT, you know, what are some good products to go along with this microphone I'm gonna purchase for the purpose of podcasting? Um, I'm sure there's a whole host of products you might think about. And a customer service representative automated by ChatGPT could get you to the specific products that you want to buy really, really quickly. Um, I would be willing to bet by the end of the year, um, e-commerce websites like Amazon will use a ChatGPT-like interface. I think there's already a Shopify plugin. Shopify is another um, really popular e-commerce platform that... Um, has a chat GPT plugin for the specific purpose, helping people find the right product and when they have those products, helping them use it. And again, it frees up a lot of time of the 1-800 line of, of sort of the call center people that need to answer these complex questions, but don't even necessarily have all the information. They might need to go and talk to a subsequent expert to get their customer the right answer. Chat GPT can have answers to those questions much quicker. There's a ton of other industries chat GPT is going to have an impact on. Um, we don't have time to go into them today. Product design, education, transportation, really you name it. Um, chat GPT is likely to have an impact because almost every industry has some interface with language. Chat GPT is a large language model. It can speed up language tasks really quickly. So how to get started with chat GPT? I think the best way to get started with ChatGPT is to just start. You know, make an account with uh, OpenAI and start chatting. Use the free version, ask it questions, and then ask it follow-up questions. And then ask it to um, transform its responses in ways that are meaningful to you. Some of these you can do just for fun. You know, um, give me an explanation of quantum physics like I'm a five-year-old and then turn that into a poem and then turn that into the plot of a children's book and then turn that into a you know, college-level essay and just see what different things happen um, when you give it these prompts. 
The other thing that I think is really interesting to do is take a piece of text, put it into ChatGPT. ChatGPT has a huge bandwidth in the text window. I think it's like 64,000 characters or something like that. Maybe it's, it's less than that, 5,000 characters. Um, but it has a pretty decent bandwidth. You can essentially copy and paste, let's say, a whole article by a, a website or a news periodical. Say you got an article from the New York Times and you could put that in, say, ChatGPT, give me a critique of this article, some things that the author didn't consider and why those might change my opinion from the author's opinion of the article. And you'll have ChatGPT being able to give you sort of the devil's advocate against whatever the article says. Or you can just take a thousand you know, word article, dump it into ChatGPT and say, ChatGPT, write me a summary of this in like two sentences or give me a bullet pointed list of all the key points. Transforming language with ChatGPT is really powerful. Getting quick explanations to long pieces of text, I think is one of the huge values. It's essentially the speed reader. You can say, give me the takeaways from this piece of text with regards to whatever perspective. How would you view this if you were a business leader? How would you, would you view this if you were a customer? How would you view this if you were a middle income stay at home parent that lived in the Midwest? And ChatGPT will transform its responses based on the perspective you tell it to take. I think that's really interesting. When it comes to business operations, you need to break down your entire business workflow to the interactions with language and the time that you spend or your employees spend at the keyboard a lot, right? And so maybe that's um, typing up minutes to a meeting. So one of the ways that we're looking into using chat GPT at IP Capital Group is generating takeaway notes from every meeting that happens. So we'll have a web meeting on Microsoft Teams. We can download the automated transcript from that meeting into Microsoft Teams. We can put that transcript in to ChatGPT. We can ask it to create a bullet pointed list of minutes from the meeting. And then we can ask it to create an executive summary of those bullet points. We're still playing around with this. Sometimes this seems a little bit um, challenging to, to you know, arduous at first. For instance, if the meeting is longer than a few minutes, the text might have to be generated, you might have to put in chat after chat after chat to get all of the information into ChatGPT. Um, one of the ways I use it is I'll take very terse, very brief bullet pointed notes through a meeting. I'll give ChatGPT the topic of the meeting and then the bullet pointed list. And then I'll tell ChatGPT to create a um, a checklist of action items that came from the notes. And even with my very brief bullet pointed outline, it's very good at figuring out what actually seems like action items and what just seems like notes. And it'll actually use the notes as context for the action items because it understands the hierarchy of the bullet points. I think that's a really interesting way to deploy it. One of the things that you should be sort of concerned, and this is already sort of looking towards the next topic, which I, I don't want to jump too far ahead, but chat GPT, if you give it generic prompts, will give you generic results. And so if you try to automate personal communications, there's a real risk that maybe not now when chat GPT is still a bit new, of course, it's creating a lot of buzz on the internet. Um, not everyone spends a lot of time on the sort of open, <laughs> um, you know, on the, the sort of buzz spectrum of the internet, places like social media, like Twitter and LinkedIn, where ChatGPT is um, ubiquitous. But I think in the coming years, people will have, a, a coming weeks even, people will have a really um, well-developed sniff test for does this piece of text look like it's generated by um, an AI like ChatGPT. And one example of, I've been playing with ChatGPT almost every day now for several weeks, three or four weeks, and I will start to see its word choice, its cadence, things that are sort of ChatGPT's tells. Um, I won't go into all of those in this article, but ChatGPT is really consistent about things like transition words, 
So it tends to start um, the second, um, it starts every chunk of text as, you know, with a summary, and then it will say like firstly, and then it will give you its first point, and secondly, and additionally. So each paragraph will typically start with these transition words, which is good writing style by some measures, but um, if it's done super consistently, it almost starts to sound like a human wouldn't write in, in that particular cadence all the time. And one of the ways I see this a lot is the last paragraph of any generated text, especially long form articles generated by ChatGPT, you'll always see this tr um, transition word like overall, this is what the article about, or you know, in summary, in conclusion, this is what, of course, people do write that phrase every once in a while, but great writers don't really fall back, um, or even good writers don't really fall back on these really generic transition words all the time, and instead get to the point because, especially writing on the, the internet is limited bandwidth. Every extra word actually makes it harder and harder for people to get to the point, and they're more likely to leave the website and try to get to the information quicker. If you have too many words that maybe are typical of good writing, but actually don't add any content or context to the article. So for instance, if you have you know, a heading in an article summary, there's not really much of a point to adding in conclusion before the paragraph. A good writer might decide to just start the paragraph. And um, there's a lot of other little tells like that with, with ChatGPT. So be very careful when you deploy ChatGPT in personal communications and in writing. Um, an email you know, written to someone that looks like it's generated by generative text. If they've exchanged emails with you before and the generative text is very different, much more long form and orderly than your typical writing, they're probably gonna be suspicious that this might have not really been written by you. Of course, you wrote the prompt and that's something, but I think most people are gonna have, at least for a while, a bit of an uncomfortable sense about getting a chat GPT result from personal communication. There was an um, example of a pretty big blunder in the business world on this line where a CEO used chat GPT to write a email where he was announcing layoffs for the company. It's just sort of in bad taste, right? This CEO wouldn't take the time to tell, in his own words, his employees why they were going to lose their jobs. So levels where you want a really personal interaction, you tread very cautiously when it comes to ChatGPT. I would use ChatGPT as maybe a suggestion, but not actually use any of the content from ChatGPT when I'm having a, any level of personal communication. And this is even professional personal communication. When I communicate with clients, if I send them an email that looks like it's written by ChatGPT, maybe not now, but in the coming weeks, I'm fairly certain that will be a, a bit of a turnoff, um, to use a, a, a colloquial phrase. Um, but it still stands to reason that all over the business operation sphere, there are many, many tasks which can be sped up automated by ChatGPT where these sort of personal niceties aren't needed. Technical documentation, I think, is a really good use case. Again, you have to have an expert using ChatGPT and reviewing its output. But given that, you can put what I like to call like a stream of consciousness prompt into ChatGPT where you say, write a technical explanation of using a power drill that has a battery pack and it needs to be charged on a certain type of outlet and that it only has this much torque and you need to be this type of person if you want to use it safely and always wear safety glasses and on and on and on. You can just give a rambling sort of run on sentence to chat GPT and it'll pick up that you want a technical documentation of this particular concept and it'll organize those thoughts very clearly. So I think that's one of the really 
useful use cases for ChatGPT. Just in the same way, it can take unstructured conversation, like a transcript from a meeting, and turn it into a structured notes and bullet points and executive summaries and takeaways. You can also load technical documents that are long and difficult to understand into ChatGPT and ask it to give you um, executive level summaries. So if someone sends you a long piece of text, you want to understand what it is. Um, you want to understand if you want to take the time to read it, that could be a great use. You can dump the text into ChatGPT, ask it to give you some key takeaways, and then you can decide for yourself if it's worth reading the entire thing. There are as many deployments, use cases for ChatGPT in business as there are needs in business, which is to say just about infinite. There's really no limitation to how, why, when you can use ChatGPT. You're really only limited by your imagination. For your business, I think the most important thing is to, again, watch for areas where you spend a lot of time trying to write the right thing. Even if that's an email to your employees announcing a layoff and you want to get the words right, use ChatGPT to get you the sort of rough draft and then rewrite what ChatGPT has given you in your own words, make it personal. Think about it as like going to a how-to page or reading a, a book on the topic, you know, like a wiki how article of how to complete a certain communication. You wouldn't want to take that text right out of ChatGPT and put it into an email because it's going to look very generic. What you want to do is read through the ChatGPT's generative output and take it as a rough draft, some suggestions of content that might work for your specific use case, and then edit it or rephrase it or add in your own voice, tone, and style to make it much more customized. So those are some examples of how to get started with ChatGPT in your business operations. Now we're going to talk about some of the challenges and limitations associated with ChatGPT. We already talked about how ChatGPT doesn't know the truth about anything. So if accuracy and the truth matters about the out, how you're going to use the output, you really want to go to an authoritative source and fact check anything you get from ChatGPT. Better yet, take some text from that authoritative source, put it into ChatGPT, and then prompt ChatGPT to do some interpretation of that source information. So you give ChatGPT what you know to be the truth, and then ask it to transform that in a way that's going to be useful to you. That's a much more effective way to make sure you have really accurate, truthful output from ChatGPT. ChatGPT does have text limitations, so you can't just dump in the collective works of Shakespeare. You have to limit that input to something like 5,000 characters. Otherwise, you'll have to input it in sequence, so you can input 5,000 characters, say, you know, remember this, ChatGPT will remember it, and input it, and input, and input it. Um, this can be very tedious. We found when we were trying to generate notes for a long meeting um, from a transcript that the transcript was just too long. You needed to input it, input it in several chunks. You needed to create summaries of each chunk. Then you needed to create an executive summary of all the summaries, which is not necessarily faster than just taking notes. So one of the things you can do if you want to use you know, ChatGPT for minutes is actually just take some really rough notes during the meeting um, dump those notes into ChatGPT and ask it to create much more formal meeting minutes from the notes that you took. It's really good at taking you know, rough notes and drafting them into something that looks a lot more clean and a lot more useful. One of the interesting things to consider with ChatGPT in terms of challenges and limitations is that the legality of ChatGPT training itself on copyrighted works is still relatively unknown. And um, in order to emphasize this point, I'm going to read from a letter that OpenAI wrote and published to the you know, congressional legislative bodies of the US about their opinions about how generative AI should be treated in light of copyright law. They say, first point, under current law, 
training AI systems constitutes fair use. Point two, policy considerations underlying fair use doctrine support the finding that training AI systems constitute fair use. Point three, legal uncertainty on the copyright implications of training AI systems imposes substantial costs on AI developers and so should be authoritatively resolved. So they're saying in point one, training AI systems is fair use. Teaching an AI system how to use copyrighted works is just like teaching a student copyright works. Education is something that has been well defined as fair use of copyrighted works. OpenAI thinks training AI systems is just like that. They think policy considerations, so the current policy laws in various territories that operate under fair use doctrine support this conclusion. They think there's enough case law to support that currently. But they say in point three that there is currently legal uncertainties on the copyright implications of training AI systems. And that uncertainty imposes substantial costs on the AI developers, and so should be authoritatively resolved. Congress should declare that the law of the land is that training AI systems is fair use. Otherwise, you can imagine the implications. If it goes the other direction, and OpenAI and companies like them need to purchase a AI license to all this copyrighted works, it could become very burdensome to train a large language model. It could cost millions, billions, or even trillions of dollars to get access to the type of information the size of corpus that they would need to effectively chain, train an AI system. And to some extent, I agree with them there. This technology would be seriously disadvantaged if it had to go through all the copyright loopholes that, say, typical human derivative works do if they want to adapt a copyright for their own purposes. It's still yet to be seen what um, the future will hold for uh, the law around training AI systems. In topic seven, I want to take a quick tour through my predictions of what the future of generative AI and how chat GPT will continue to play a role in driving innovation. First of all, I think you'll start to see tuned expert systems that use chat GPT. So you will train chat GPT on the, your expert opinion on many different subjects and you'll have a specific tuned version of ChatGPT for fitness advice, for intellectual property advice, for business advice, for all sorts of even you know, um, personal consultations, psychotherapy, medicine, religious questions. You'll have ChatGPT being tuned for various purposes and deployed for that. You'll have personal assistants that are trained by ChatGPT. So it'll know your preferences for scheduling things um, the kinds of decisions that ChatGPT can make for you and when it should take decisions to you, the kinds of things it can tell other people about you when they go to talk to your personal assistant um, enabled by ChatGPT. I actually think for a lot of things, people will prefer to work with a digital assistant in things like scheduling because things will go much more faster and more smoothly. And you'll be able to understand things that you wouldn't necessarily want to ask the person themselves, like you know, what kind of gift should I get this person? Your digital assistant might know your activities, things you're interested, the things you like to buy and things you don't currently own and be able to give people suggestions where if they asked you directly, you might um, not know in the moment what a good idea would be or not want to give that anyway. Um, you're starting to see prompt engineers, people who will be paid to craft really good prompts for ChatGPT. I think you'll be able to do rapid prototypes of software and websites and even physical products using ChatGPT. You'll get information about um, the types of vendors you need to look for, the types of materials you should use, the types of instructions you can give to machinists, and all different aspects of prototyping various products and services enabled with ChatGPT. You'll see hyper-productive solo entrepreneurs who run a whole business around ChatGPT creating content uh, for niche audiences and having multiple different business streams that they can all run by themselves that would normally take in a team. They'll be able to use ChatGPT. And you'll also see ChatGPT co-pilots in almost every application. You'll see them in Word and Word, Microsoft Word will understand what you're trying to write and then be able to autofill entire paragraphs for you versus just a few words in each sentence. 
you'll see co-pilots in um, design applications like Adobe Photoshop, and you'll be able to tell it um, what you want it to do to an image in natural language, and it'll choose the transformations based on your input. You'll see it in, obviously, software coding environments. You'll see it in browser environments. So when you're looking at a website, you might be looking at a recipe. You can ask ChatGPT to modify the recipe based on the ingredients you do and don't have, the equipment you do and don't have, and it'll regenerate the recipe for you from this trusted blogger, but now with your limitations on it. So those are just a few examples of what I think the future holds for ChatGPT. In conclusion, we gave um, an explanation of what ChatGPT is. It's a large language model and its capabilities. It generates human-like text. We talked about what AI is, the history of AI from the 1950s to today. We gave some definitions of AI and how it's used in different industries. We talked about the power of GPT, what makes it different than other AI systems. We talked about real-world use cases in healthcare, in finance, in customer service, and how it could be used in various industries. We talked about how to get started on ChatGPT in your business, what to look for, what use cases might really make sense in your business for ChatGPT and how that can make you more productive. We talked about some of the challenges and limitations associated with this new technology, some of the unknowns, and what you should be careful with. And we talked a little bit about the future of ChatGPT, how it's going to be integrated into various parts of our lives. If you are enjoying the Invent Anything podcast, I thank you so much for joining us. We'd be grateful if you could follow us on Spotify or your favorite podcatcher. If you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. And you can like the video and leave a comment. We read all the comments, and that would really help us understand what you want to hear about on Invent Anything. You can give us up to a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. And if you want to see all the episodes, um, you can go to inventanything.net. And there we have a full episode guide. If you want to see what we do at IP Capital Group in terms of invention, innovation, and intellectual property consulting, you can visit ipcg.com. And there we also have a blog where we post daily content about invention, intellectual property, and innovation topics. And last but not least, never forget you can invent anything.